This is a whiskey that I've been trying unsuccessfully to track down for quite a while. It's a whiskey from the other distillery on Sky, the one that's not Talisker. This is Tora Vague. So Tora Vague is a very new distillery and this is actually the second release in a series of four of their inaugural releases. So four batches, this is the second. And Tora Vague is a distillery that a lot of people might not have heard of because apart from being very new, at least for me, they seem to have flown quite well under the radar. Saying that, these first batches have sold out incredibly quickly. They're reasonable size batches, not incredibly limited edition, but the first batch I was completely out of luck, couldn't find at all. The second of the four batches, I was lucky enough to get a bottle. And as you can see, probably a little bit of a spoiler, the fact that most of this is gone gives you an early clue to what I think of this whiskey, because I've enjoyed this quite a lot. So Tora Vague began production in 2017, so this whiskey released in 2021 is around three to four years old and it actually says on the label, 10 out of 10 for transparency on the label from Tora Vague. There's a lot of information on here which I'll go through later, but just pointing out first of all that it says that this batch, drawn from small batches of no more than 30 barrels, distilled and cast in 2017 and 18. So this is probably, legally speaking, a three-year-old single malt. Now, a little bit of history of the Tora Vague Distillery. It's owned and was established by Mossburn Distillers Limited, which itself is a fairly new company. And Mossburn Distillers Limited have also recently set up a grain distillery in the lowlands. Now, Mossburn Distillers Limited, they haven't just been sitting on their hands for the last three, four years because they've actually come out with quite a range of sourced, independently bottled whiskies while they were waiting for the stock from Tora Vague and their other projects to come to maturation. Now, the products that they've bottled so far, there's a whole range of proper independent bottlings from named distilleries with age statements, and there's a few sort of regional style whiskies like a, a Highland, an Isla whiskey, things like that. And I have been to Tora Vague Distillery, and both when I was there and when I've been looking in various shops, I have tried a few of the Mossburn independent bottlings, and to be honest, I've not been that impressed with any of them. Now, I've talked about sourced bottlings, especially sourced bottlings, by a distillery while they're waiting for their own stocks to mature before, in particular when I've been reviewing things like the Krabbies and the Dubliner Irish whiskey. And what I've always said about those type of bottlings is you have to be very careful because it's all very well making a bit of money while you're waiting for your own stocks to mature. But it says a little bit more than that because to the uninitiated, it tells people this is the sort of whiskey that we will be making, fingers crossed. But also to the veteran whiskey drinkers out there, it says a little bit more than that. It says this is what we think is acceptable. If you trust us and give us your money, this is the kind of quality that we are okay with giving you. So I think that the, the Mossburn bottlings that I've had so far, in particular the, the regional style bottlings that they gave out when I was at the Tora Vague distillery on the tour, it's not such a great first impression. But saying that, doing the tour at Tora Vague, which I highly recommend, when you actually talk to the staff and the people involved in production, you quickly come to understand that they're a really dedicated team, small team of people who really have a great dedication to quality, integrity and the tradition of whiskey making. Another thing that I really like about Tora Vague Distillery that immediately made my ears prick up when I was booking the tour is they were very proud to say that it's a very heavily peated whiskey. And they also, on the tour, gave this impression that it's going to be a very old-fashioned, traditional, earthy, hearty, kind of heavily peated whiskey from the good old days, that sort of impression. So I've been looking forward to this one for quite a while. Another phrase that they said a few times when I was there in person is well-tempered peat. 
and that's a phrase that appears on their literature and actually on the label as well. And well-tempered peat, I always sort of interpreted that as heavily peated, but also well-integrated and a well-matured peatiness. So it's not just a dumb peat bomb, because it has to be said that there are whiskies out there. Lefroig, sadly, does come to mind that there's a lot of Lefroy or some Lefroig expressions where there's a big hit, hit of peat, but there's not that much to back it up. Also thinking of things like the, the peat monster from Compass Box, which was an enjoyable whiskey in my opinion, but again, a bit of a dumb peat bomb could have been a little bit more going on. So well-tempered peat, hopefully that means that this one is not just in-your-face phenolics, it's got something else to back it up. Now, I have also got some photographs that I took of Toro Vague Distillery and the surrounding area when I was there. And sadly, I haven't got any photos from the inside of the distillery because sadly, Toro Vague is one of those distilleries that don't let you take any photographs of anything in the production areas in case you obviously take those photos and go home and start making the whiskey yourself in your shed. It's a little bit strange, it's usually the Diageo distilleries that don't allow photographs inside the distillery. But even that, I think a lot of the Diageo distilleries, they're even allowing you to take photographs inside, so hopefully one day Toro Vague will let us do the same in their distillery. Anyway, photographs, this first photo that I've got is the front of the distillery itself. So from this photo you can see that you've got the lovely traditional whitewashed or whitewashed effect distillery building with the, the distillery name in those great big letters across the front of the building and obviously that pagoda roof on top as well. So as soon as you turn up at the distillery this is one of the first things you see. Obviously this very well manicured lawn, very traditional building, pagoda roof and also the interesting little water wheel that you can see on the left hand side of the photo as well. So to me, when you first get to the distillery and you see this view of the, the whitewashed building with the traditional pagoda roof, it's saying one thing, we're all about tradition, we're not doing anything new and unusual, we're doing things the old fashioned way, the right way. So that's a really reassuring thing to me when I turn up and that's the first thing that you see. Just another little interesting aside, the pagoda roof that so many of us associate with Scotch whiskey distilleries, it's actually quite a bizarre thing. It's, it's a, a completely Asian design aspect to these distilleries that's just popped up in the middle of Scotland and it's been around for so long that a lot of people in these modern times see it as a very traditional, reassuring thing. But it's actually only been around for about a hundred years and it was an architect called Charles Doig that went around putting these pagoda roofs on the, the ventilators above the malting floors on all these distilleries. So it's only really the last century where it's really become synonymous with the Scotch whisky industry. To the point where obviously the vast, vast majority of Scotch distilleries these days are not malting any of their barley themselves. But still, we've got even new distilleries popping up and putting this pagoda roof above one of their buildings because it's just so iconic and traditional. The second photograph that I've got to show you is the courtyard that you see when you first go into the distillery. So this quaint looking little arrangement they've got with the picnic benches, which were empty when I was there because despite it looking quite sunny, it had actually been tipping it down with rain most of the day and it was quite overcast with some threatening clouds. But the, the buildings that you can see there, the buildings in the background actually house some of the production areas. And as you can see from the sign, you've got the, the gift shop and the front desk to the left and a lovely little cafe to the right hand side. So yet another reason why if you are in the region of Sky, it's a great idea to pay a visit to Tour of Egg. I'll also mention, as they do at several points when you're talking to the people that work there, that they say that the stone that makes up those buildings, some of it was actually taken from a ruined castle which was situated near where they've built the distillery. So again, that's another little bit of living history literally built into the distillery building itself. The third photo that I've got to show you is the view outside of that courtyard. So this is just on the other side of that gate that you pass through. 
and you can see those threatening clouds that I was talking about. And you can also see the, the lovely grass and all the hills and heather. It's all looking absolutely superb. Because the thing about Scotland is even if it absolutely chucks it down, you can still have a great time and it all always looks absolutely phenomenal. And you can actually see towards the back of the third photograph, there's three people standing on a little observation deck. And this fourth photo that I've got for you is taken from that observation deck. And that really just shows you how the place that they've chosen for Torreveg Distillery really is Scotland in all of its natural and unspoilt glory. I was actually on a little bit of a tight time frame when I was there, as I usually am. So I never actually asked if there was any like proper walking routes around the distillery. But from my experience, I have found that in Scotland, they do tend to be more tolerant of camping and walking and people that just want to experience Scotland in its beauty. It's definitely a lot more tolerant of people just walking around and wanting to experience the wilderness than people tend to be in England. And I believe you can actually see, if you look in the distance on the right-hand side of this fourth photograph, you can actually see the remains of the castle that some of the stone was supposedly taken from to build the buildings that now house Torreveg Distillery. So that's probably enough holiday slides. Let's get some in the glass while we've still got some left and see what it's like. As I mentioned before, there is an absolute abundance of information on the label of this one. And I won't go too far into that before we get to the tasting, but I'll just point out that this is a complete integrity bottling. So we haven't got an age statement, but we know that this was distilled between 2017 and 2018. We know that it is aged in first fill bourbon and refill whiskey barrels, bottled at 46% with no chill filtration or colouring, and a residual phenol level of 17 ppm. Now, that's really interesting. It also actually says, and I've never seen, I don't think I've ever seen any whisky that gives you so much information on the label as they do on this tour of egg, because it also tells you that the, the barley is a mix of concerto and laureate malted barley with an ingrain phenol content of 77 ppm even goes into depth to tell you what strains of yeast were used in the fermentation. Anyway, we'll come back to that in a little while. Let's taste some, or at least know some and then taste some. So on the nose, beautiful color. <laughs> I will get around to nosing it and tasting it eventually. Beautiful nose to go with a beautiful color. It's not an immediately immature whiskey. It's a very well made whiskey. And there is quite a bit of peat there. It's quite a dry, slightly challenging whiskey. Quite dry, mineral, chalky barley notes. Getting some salty, sweet lemon, some grapefruit, as well as some. It's quite a medicinal whiskey. Some iodine, some menthol and a hard, medicinal, slightly briny peat. And here's, a, here's a, a nice tasting note for you. Also getting a bit of an aroma of dimethyl sulfide. Now, dimethyl sulfide is the smell that you get on the seashore, like rock pools and the, the foamy sea scum that you get that gathers on the, the shoreline. Basically all the sort of congealed remains of microbial dead sea creatures that form on the shore. That really sort of off, creamy, salty, really bracing seashore smell. A little bit of that on the nose of this one. Definitely rock pools, seashores. A little bit of an industrial note in the peat as well. It is, it's not an overly overpowering peat, but it's definitely a slightly industrial, dirty peat. A slight pepperiness to the peat, a little bit like something you might get in a Talisker. Overall, I'm going to say that the nose is relatively simple, but very focused and very high quality. Let's see how it tastes. Really is 
a beautifully refreshing color. You know it's a natural color when there's just no no hint of sherry or caramel. It's just at least a predominantly bourbon matured whiskey comes out that very light straw color. You don't need coloring in whiskey. Coloring is not quality. That is a joy to behold. As is the palette on this whiskey. Again, as per the nose, getting quite a bit of lemoniness, and it's quite a, a chalky, salty, sweet lemon. Also getting quite a bit of coastal brininess. Now, those bourbon casks are definitely making their presence known. So you're getting quite a creamy, light vanilla, honey bourbon note. And that goes really well with this sweet and sharp lemony citrus character that is all the way through this whiskey. As for the peat, I'm going to say that it's um, a dry, sour, wood smoke type of peat. It's not an extremely peated whiskey. Now, when they say, I didn't want to go into the label too much, but they said that it's 77 ppm in the barley, which is a hell of a lot. It's actually quite a bit more heavily peated, even than Ardbeg. Way more peated than things like Laphroaig or Bowmore or Highland Park. I personally would say that this is quite a bit less peaty than your average Ardbeg. Quite a bit less peaty than the Ardbeg 10. I'd also say that it's a touch less peaty than the more peaty releases that you get from Anuk, the Nokdu distillery. And I say that in particular because Nokdu, or Anuk, is the only distillery that I know of that regularly put on the label the actual phenol content of the finished product. So basically what I'm saying is when they state phenol content on the label, it's really nice when we know, really, really appreciate that they've put that on there. But as for how meaningful it is, when you're comparing between different distilleries, there's so much more that comes into play that decides on how PT or whiskey ends up that it's basically a little bit of BS. But the important thing is, the peat in this one, there's quite a bit, and it's more than enough. All in all, I'd say that the palette on this one, again, it is a little bit simple, but it is a young whiskey. It's also quite light and refined, but it's also quite flavorful and extremely pleasant. It's gonna have another little sip and look at the finish. really is an incredibly enjoyable whiskey, as you can see. I think that anyone that likes a heavily peated whiskey and anyone that likes their sharp, citrusy, spirity whiskey, so things like Ardbeg, Kalila, Kilkerran, things like that, um, Ben Romick, perhaps, anyone that likes those sorts of whiskey will really enjoy this one. As for the finish, I think that the peat actually does kind of dominate on the finish finish is a little bit light again, some short creamy vanilla, a little bit of wood smoke, and you're really left with a slightly astringent sort of peated grapefruit note, which is something that I really like. As for a grade, I'm going to give this one a B. So I think that's a really good effort. That's in the middle of the very good territory in my grading scale. So for a three-year-old whiskey and an inaugural release, I think that's really good, and I'll definitely be keeping an eye on anything that comes from Toro Vague in future. So, as I promised, that's the tasting out of the way. I think it's time to get geeky, because I have been mentioning all the way through this review that there's a huge amount of information. Pretty much everything that you could ever wish to know is on the label of this whiskey. It's really, really commendable. Obviously, integrity bottling, 46%, natural colour, no chill filtration, heavily peated single malt whiskey, a mix of concerto and laureate malted barley, ingrained phenol content of 77 ppm. So technically that's much peatier than Ardbeg, although as I said before, when you get it in the glass, not so much. I would say probably 80% as much peat as you get in the typical Ardbeg 10. Fermented with Pinnacle MG Plus and Safe Spirit M1 yeasts. What other distillery do you know that tells you the the barley variety and the yeast strains. There are some out there, but I don't think I've ever seen this level of complete transparency on anything. I really hope that they continue to do this. 
first fill bourbon and refill whiskey barrels. Now that is the one thing that I am curious about and I want to know about this whiskey. Obviously first fill bourbon, they could have told us where those bourbon costs are coming from. I'm sure if you asked they probably would do. But refill whiskey barrels. Now this distillery has only been around for around three, four years. So those refill whiskey barrels are probably not Tour of Egg whiskey barrels. So whose are they? Because you would think that if they're refill whiskey barrels, they may have just done that to take the edge off the first fill bourbon so you don't get too much of a vanilla, honey, caramel, sweet, nutty, bourbony sort of bourbon bomb. But you would also think that if they're refill barrels from another distillery, which they almost certainly are, you would think that this whiskey is picking up a little bit of character from that distillery. And especially if that's the nearby Talisker distillery, is there a little bit of Talisker in this whiskey from Sky? That's an interesting question, and I think that's one that I'm going to have to put to the distillery to see if we can get an answer on that one. And that last little piece of information on the, the back label, the residual phenol content, so not the PPM in the malted barley, which is more often than not that not that useful to know but the actual residual phenol content in the bottle is 17 parts per million so the only other distillery that i'm aware of that regularly tells you residual phenol content is Nokdu that produces anak whiskey and their whiskey tends to be ranges from the high single digits to the high teens so 17 ppm would be one of the smokier whiskies from Nokdu. But again, I would say that comparing this to something like, I don't know, the Petia Anak releases, what would they be? Something like Stack. I would say that this has got a little bit, maybe 80% as much peat as one of those high teen whiskies from Anak. But that's not to say anything negative about this whiskey at all, because there is so much else from the way that you distill the barley to how you mature it, how airtight the casks are, how fresh the casks are, how long you mature the whiskey. There's just a million and one things that influence how much peat ends up in the bottle. And even when you've got that set level of peat in the bottle, there's another million and one things that influence how that peat is presented and how much of it you can actually taste. It's really a very complex thing. So I'm going to say again, it's wonderful that they've given this, these figures and they are a useful guideline, but in making scientific comparisons between which whiskey is more PT based on PPM, it's not that meaningful, even in the bottle. So another question that I would ask myself based on this whiskey and mainly in trying to help people that might be wondering if this whiskey is for them, is what would I compare this whiskey to? What do I think it's similar to? Now, one recent whiskey that I have had that I would say that this is quite similar to is, and this seems a little bit bizarre, especially to anyone that hasn't had it, but the peated grain whiskey that Loch Lomond have just released. That's another very lemony, very spirit-driven, heavily peated, focused, laser-sharp, really high-quality whiskey. And I'd say if you like that whiskey from Loch Lomond, you'd probably love this. And if you love this, you've got an absolute bargain on your hands if you can get hold of a bottle of that peated grain whiskey from Loch Lomond. There is a review of that one coming up soon when I get around to it, but definitely in the near future. Other whiskies that I would compare this to, again, slightly odd that they're not your traditional single malts, but I'm getting some quite triple distilled vibes from this whiskey. So I'd compare this to, probably not many people have had this, but the, the heavily peated triple distilled whiskey from the English Whiskey Company, and also the heavily peated triple distilled Ben Romick whiskey. I think that with that well-tempered peat, as they put it, it's really close to those sort of heavily peated triple distilled whiskies with their, their really clean, sharp and focused spiritiness, but with that dirty, old-fashioned peatiness. I'm also, and again, another bizarre comparison because it's not even scotch, but certain 
smoky, some of the very smoky mezcals that you can get, the really high quality ones. I'm also getting some sort of smoky mezcal vibes from this. Again, because it's that combination of really spirity and really intense, dirty smokiness at the same time. And lastly, I'll probably say Kilkerran. Kilkerran is a fantastic whiskey. It's possibly, it's definitely up there with my favourite whiskies that have come from the Springbank Company of all time. I think Kilkerran whiskey has gone from strength to strength, right from the work in progress releases, all the way up to the the 12 year old and the no aid statement heavily peated releases that you get now. Fantastic stuff. And again, anyone that likes Kilkerran will probably like this. So I think that's probably about all I can say and all I can show you on this one. Apart from saying that it's a fantastic whiskey and you should probably all keep an eye out for it because I certainly will in future. I can't wait to see what they come out with next. Thanks for watching and cheers.